Yeah, we have very big application load. <laughs> no, I would say the people recognizing. Uh, I would also, we have till 12th, yeah, from kindergarten till 12th standard. But I would say uh, the last thing I want to say for your question is also that uh, we have, it's a bit like a sanctuary also in one way that like a, for, if a child, like four people who are very, uh, let's say, well to do, and they put them in different schools. And like you were saying, no, like the child is not able to read and write. We do have applications like that. We have special needs in our school. And we have children who, not all children, but there are parents, whole host of applications on, they're not able to fit in into the regular schooling mainstreams. But we don't take all the children. Yeah. So they... <laughs> so... So that... You have, we have your presentation, it's being shared with the group. Please sit down. Huh? I think you can get a laptop. Can she see that and move to the next slide? So, uh, if uh, Asha, US participants are there on the screen. Can you uh, speak up? Uh, we haven't heard anything from your side. I didn't even know that you were there in the conference. Is uh, output Varuma speaker yeah. in the laptop or output? Binay and others in Asha Atlanta, can you speak up? Can you hear us now? Okay. Ah, so we are kind of hearing you. Okay. Can you hear us clearly now? Yes. Uh, Binay, uh, I'll, uh, can you start the introduction? So I don't still see you. So can you change, change the view? Okay, so Raja Ram, can you hear us? Can you yes, hear us? Can. So give us just one minute. So, Sampat Kumar, please change the view so that we can see their side. English and the path of On the screen, the same screen. So, Binay, have you turned on the video from your side? So we are switching on the video. We have only switched on the voice. Okay, please switch on the video. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. we are. So they are, uh, so they are uh, based out of uh, right now in Atlanta. 
Okay, Vinay, I don't know who you are. We are seeing some distant vision. You can uh, show of hands. We will know who is Vinay. Ah, okay. Good. We'll focus closely, so just give us two minutes. So let me just start with a quick introduction of uh, uh, Simantrini. I don't know too much about uh, this thing, so I think Vinay will take over from me uh, to continue with the introduction. So uh, Simantrini ji is from the NGO Avehi. So this is an NGO with which Asha has been associated for a number of years, over a decade, I believe. 15 years, okay. And uh, Asha Seattle particularly has been supporting uh, Avehi Abacus for uh, like all these years. And uh, from uh, like, it's been a, uh, like basically an NGO which has uh, moved, uh, like uh, kind of been very successful in working with the government schools, improving the quality of education there. And over these years, uh, it has uh, kind of improved education in significant ways. Uh, demonstrable significant ways and we wanted to hear uh, Sinanthani ji's perspective and Avehi's perspective. So if possible, uh, Mrs. Ratna Shah Patak uh, will also be joining, uh, but if possible, sir. Okay. Yeah, if possible, she will also join uh, the presentation. So uh, she is also part of the Avehi team. So I'll hand over the microphone to Mrs. Simantani. So Vinay, uh, if you have anything to add, please do. Yeah, so I wanted first to have the welcome message from the Atlanta chapter, and then I'll maybe speak for a few seconds, and then I'll talk about Simantani ji and not happy to wait for the talk. Thanks, Vinay. So uh, we just want to say a quick welcome from the Atlanta chapter here and all of the conference team. We know that um, India and Europe already started off, and so we'll be kicking off in the US right now. So we're very excited to have the 30 years conference and to be able to host it um, in the Southeast over here. Um, and so we'll be for the first time actually having it be intercontinental. And so we're hoping that this will allow us to forge connections, not just within the US chapters or Europe or India alone, but to share some of the, um, what worked and some of the challenges and to kind of, um, bring us together all across the globe. Um, so we have a lot of fun sessions and talks planned for the day. And so we're excited to um, kick this all off and we'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's here in person in India, Europe and in Atlanta, as well as all of the people who are able to join us online. Um, so since this is the first time we can do this, um, we're uh, really looking forward to it. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Binay and uh, we're excited for this, thanks. Thank you, Sriti, and thank you, Atlanta team, for welcoming us. I think this has been a pleasure. Like, I have been here for almost a couple of days now, and nothing but, you know, very smooth sailing. Thank you for hosting us. Now, I'll take a few seconds to, you know, like, tell my working experience with Simantani ji and Ratna Pataksa, and in fact, all of our very team. So I had the privilege of being the project steward from ASA side for Avehi Avekas. And I have been there, I think, uh, uh, almost uh, when uh, Avehi uh, project started partnering with uh, ASA. It was, I think, early 2000s. Like, uh, and uh, one of our ASA Seattle founder, Jayasri, who, who is not here today, but uh, like, uh, she was one of the early members of ASA Seattle who figured that you know, like what the way he is doing is just amazing. Like when we look at education, there's just so many facets of it that we need to improve. And you know, like some of the critical ones, like stand in terms of the whole experience of you know, like education. How do you provide the education? How you know, like the pupils are in, you know, like experiencing it? As, you know, like if you look at what my experience was and what you know, like I kind of see in the US, some of the schools my kids are going have, 
versus what you know, like I say, you know, like see uh, you know, like is possibility in terms of what can be done in India. I, when I looked at some of the curriculum, I had the privilege to look at you know, like some of the curriculum that was developed by OAP. It was just amazing. The way to teach, the way to you know, like uh, inculcate the knowledge and focusing on knowledge versus you know, like uh, just getting the numbers in the exam. It was just you know, like a different uh, eye-opening experience for me. So I won't take uh, you know, like too much time of uh, you know, like, uh, the audience here. I, I think we want to hear more from Simantani ji and others from the Hawaii team and see you know, like, uh, how uh, we can learn and grow. And hopefully she will give some of the knowledge that will not only address you know, like what the Sangati team is doing, but also, you know, share some of the vision on, you know, like some of our, our other project partners who are working on scaling their project or we are, who are working on improving the quality of education in their space or who are working with the government schools to improve the you know, like quality of education that is given to underprivileged at scale. So that, you know, like we will take a lot of learning from this session. With that, Simantani ji, thank you for you know, making time to join us. We are really privileged to have you and hope to learn a lot from you. Thank you. Uh, you can start. I think. Hello. First of all, uh, it's our privilege to have been given this space and time with everyone here as well as uh, all of you. Uh, in Europe and uh, US, and for the support, the uh, support, the unstinting support, and the camaraderie that we have received from Asha. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have been here. Uh, and this I really mean deeply, not as a formality. So, uh, what I'm hoping to do is to, because most of the people here are probably not familiar with uh, exactly what we do. So I'm going to take a little time to just run through broadly what we do and where we work, and then uh, perhaps uh, you know locate our work in the larger situation as we are today. Uh, yeah. So as you can see, we have uh, we started work. Uh, you know, with similar kind of ideas, disturbed about how we learned as students and what education was meant to be, definitely wasn't what it is. And, uh, and that basically looks, has to look at our lives and society in a holistic way. And we are to uh, education both for self uh, fulfillment, for enjoyment about learning, creating knowledge, as well as, I mean, as an individually fulfilling experience, as well as to make the society a better place and not limited only to gains on a uh, selfish uh, individual level. And uh, so uh, seeing it, it is essentially so, 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 uh, a social experience. It is not something simply to get a good job and uh, you know have a comfortable life and uh, one of the things that as we were growing up we saw the distance between what life is and what is taught in school as well as the uh, as well as the boundaries that are there in the subjects that are taught in school and so our work is based in fact on work that was done organi organically by our uh, founder director shanta gandhi uh, who, while uh, as a freedom fighter after the freedom when she was working in Adivasi village, found that there was no school there. So her learnings were with the uh, Adivasi uh, children and the community. And later on, when she came to Bombay, we built on that. But our primary concern was that something that she had done um, in a personal capacity was actually also tried out at the Balbhavans and uh, other places. We felt that what needed to be done was to take this out in the regular system, that it should not get confined to individuals and few schools. That would then make a very, you know, good kind of, a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a foolproof place, a, a curriculum in their own little schools, that it needed to permeate in the larger discourse, larger system. And so we started working in a municipal school. Uh, this was one of the ideas that we don't kind of, you know, get uh, uh, 
confined to a small place. Uh, also that it is our duty as well as our right to intervene in the system at large and not simply kind of, you know, be able to talk about it from outside. Again, none of us are trained formally in education. But so we started working in a municipal school and we, uh, with min one municipal school, we uh, then were asked questions by uh, people who supported us based on the kind of, you know, uh, results that we were getting in the school as to why we were not working with teachers and, you know, because our facilitator used to work there. And so we started working with teachers and that was one of the most difficult phase of our life when we were working with 25 municipal schools. And we were asked questions that we were, you know, uh, experimenting and uh, on the uh, teachers and on the uh, students and things. But when we came down to looking at themes that are seen typically, you know, problematic and controversial, like communalism or caste or stereotyping and, you know, critically looking at society, we felt that the attitude of teachers were changing. And so after that, we went to expanding our work since last roughly about 15 years plus, we've been working with all the municipal schools in Bombay, where the teachers who are regular teachers implement the curriculum that we have. So ours is a, ours is a, a supplementary uh, curriculum, uh, enrichment curriculum, but it is does not necessarily enrich without criticality. Criticality is the core component of uh, our intervention. That you look at all the knowledge systems in the school, outside school, as well as the science and social sciences in an integrated manner, the way we uh, see the world. So it is, um, so as far as the schools are concerned, we have a curriculum module which runs over three academic years in a non-formal non, uh, school system. Uh, people use it in their own pace. So it is broadly in the age group of 11 to 16. But since we work with the municipal schools, and since most of the municipal schools end at 7th standard in Maharashtra, we end up working from class 5 to class 7. But it could be differently in different places. So that is the uh, module, curriculum module called Sangati, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, available in three different languages, Hindi, Marathi, uh, English for teachers, and workbooks are there for children. They're in eight different languages because the municipal schools are in eight different languages, which is what we are proud and privileged to have. And so uh, the workbooks are a way of knowing how the child is changing rather than assessing child on an outside criteria of a certain events. You look at the changes in the child uh, and the growing up processes of child and the opinions and ideas of the child also rather than simply those things that are called knowledge, which essentially is very limited kind of information. And so that is a Sangati module. I'll quickly run you through the, the themes later. As we started working, we realized that while working with the schools, with the in-service teachers, we get very little time to interact with the teachers. And the teachers already come there with the very formed ideas. And they're set in a system which they find very difficult to uh, reprocess in that sense. And there may be a situation where somebody like us or people like her may not be there to, you know, to be able to have that perspective about society and knowledge, about education, about development and so on and so forth. So we felt we needed to work also at the pre-service level. And uh, uh, so we developed a module uh, called Manthan, which is a two-year module, runs across the diploma, diploma in teacher education. And we work with about 20 odd colleges currently uh, in semi rural and uh, tribal areas, uh, and some, some of them also in Bombay, uh, where the teacher educators work with the teacher, uh, teacher trainees and teacher, student teachers. Um, after the Delhi gang rape, there was a lot of hue and cry also about the issues of gender being focused. So, while gender or 
you know, any of the issues of discrimination and justice are interwoven in all our curriculum. We felt that, you know, doing a separate module on gender may help. And so we also did a module called Saat Saat, which concentrates only on the issues of gender justice and formation of gender identities and so on and so forth, which relates to many other aspects like work and I, I don't think we have the time to go into that. Uh, so these are our three modules. Uh, this is more or less the way we have worked over last 30 years, starting from one classroom to uh, reaching all the schools in Bombay Municipal Corporation. Currently only 100, sorry, 600 odd, so 33 schools are uh, uh, because many schools are uh, not yet open and there are many multi-grade classrooms and so our outreach currently during the pandemic has gone down. Uh, this is roughly the number of students. I have sent the presentations to Rajanandan, so uh, it can be shared with everyone here. This is the current outreach. So I don't think the numbers are necessary. I would like to then share with you our concern about locating our work in public education institutes. And I've already talked about this. It's because these are spaces that are your and mine. Uh, people like us who live in black cities, we don't have the privilege of, you know, being able to work in smaller, a bit smaller uh, communities. And that itself is a very enriching experience, even personally. But the schools that are there in a situation like Bombay, they exist. And so we feel that by working with schools on, in a, on a larger scale, yeah. one is that we are able to, uh, you know, to kind of um, test our work, to understand our work, to see its relevance, that it is not something that we feel alone, mm -hmm. but that it is an idea, idea that is shared by people at large. And it's not like they agree with each and everything that is there. There is a lot of resistance. But that um, uh, one needs to rather than have, uh, this is our view, is that rather than build parallel systems, work with whosoever is there, wherever they, they are. And our primary focus is with the public, public institutions because as citizens, we feel that we have a right to intervene there. We work with the teachers that are there, and that is one of the biggest challenge that there is, because teachers are inundated with a lot of work, and they're extremely, you know, um, uh, uh, demotivated. Uh, their work as teachers itself is not recognized, really. So uh, we need to kind of understand that, have empathy, and give them the respect they have, want, they need. And uh, to, uh, to kind of remodel the role of teachers as people who are thinkers, as people who are concerned people, who are there in their classrooms with the children, to rekindle those uh, uh, things with them and to kind of share, uh, uh, you know, to kind of share uh, uh, their concerns about working with uh, uh, situations that are very challenging. And so we feel that by doing that one, also acknowledges the professional role that a teacher has in a school rather than replace her. Um, while there is a very uh, limited and moribund way of preparing teachers at uh, a teacher preparatory stage, it is not only these institutes that are uh, separate, they are part of a larger society. So in order to change the discourse around education, one must also intervene where these institutes are because it's through them that we are perhaps going to be able to make uh, policymakers look at uh, education differently. And so uh, uh, work with the teachers or uh, facilitators of organizations in uh, wherever we work with other like-minded organizations with schools. Um, then uh, our curriculum, uh, while it does not replace the existing curriculum and it supplements and enriches it, one of the, I mean, that is a kind of a easy way as well as a difficult way. Because if you change, if you have the leverage to change the textbooks, for example, some organizations in India have successfully done that for a while. It is not necessary that these, those textbooks are that the textbooks 
through which uh, the, the, through a certain perspectives are going to stay when a political dispensation changes education is one of the thing that takes the uh, you know the uh, uh, hit and particularly social sciences so uh, one needs to kind of create carve that space out so that you somehow manage to kind of stay in rather than get kicked out altogether and uh, the other thing is knowledge is not static society is not static and so one needs to also have something that is there in between that fills the uh, you know fills the gap as uh, things change and have some a kind of a broader understanding which is uh, which can be evolved through an integrated curriculum rather than put it in the silos of uh, you know uh, uh, subject bound discipline bound areas which tend to then go along the lines of exams and success and the stuff so that because basically one needs needs inputs to understand why we are learning and how that is related with what the world is uh, we also endeavor to work with policy making bodies as i said earlier so that both to test the efficacy of our work and also to kind of integrate our experience it on at a larger level um i've more or less said this so, so we try to provide links between different subjects taught in school help children integrate all that they learn in school and their knowledge from outside so knowledge from outside is very much part of what is learned it's not something uh, of a one way process uh, ch children's self confidence and the skills of you know the critical uh, observation analysis articulation and decision making provide perspectives based on values that emphasize independence and need to live together in harmony so as far as the sangati curriculum is concerned there are these six themes uh, in very brief the first one which is called myself my body and our needs looks at you know my how i develop and how that's a social how i am socially constructed as well as some basic things about how i as myself my own body itself is how it is diverse that it is filled with so many different things because later as the children grow up we are going to build on these ideas and then we look at how the body is made uh, which is something which is broken up in school syllabus you know we look at it in a whole our needs which are uh, common in a sense fulfilled diversely but also because of issues of discrimination then we link it to the next theme which is our earth in the web of life we normally tend to look at history or you know look at our past only through the lens of human societies you we need to go back to how the world itself came into being and the in a sense the story of evolution we also besides looking at the explanation that science gives look at the myths and you know understanding that different societies across the world even including uh, uh, supposedly simple societies have and then going to understanding how evolution happened and this is very fundamental because unless and until you understand that smallness of human life you will never understand the destruction that humans have uh, uh, wrought on earth uh, uh, and you know the the kind of impact that we had on earth despite us being just a little uh, snippet of thing in the whole web of life so the next theme is that then we go to the we end it with homo sapiens sapiens we pick up at uh, pick up at how society is developed which is kit 3 uh which uh, picks uh, which starts at the early civilizations and comes to uh, 1950 and essentially it is the process of helping children look at how history is constructed the science of history how it is something which is not uh, there in the books and written in once and for all it is based on perspectives it is based on what is found and there are a lot of debates around it uh, how you can yeah. yeah please continue yeah um, there are a lot of debates around it and also that when we talk about history particularly in our our uh, uh, our country and our state it is very personality centric or it is very uh, geometry centric 
it's very state centric and it is basically making people feel quote unquote proud about their culture and so on and so forth here there is no question of pride as humanity we have done many things that we can learn from and we don't know enough about it because we are taught history primarily from the angle of those who have left the their history to be told but there are many societies which don't haven't left that so we also talk about the history of those societies and how that uh, you know that has impacted the way humans are, on the whole have developed it's a totality of human experience also evaluate what are the things that have been done uh, around uh, the world in term from the from the perspective uh, of uh, you know justice essentially to put it very simply uh, then we come to the way indian society today is and uh, how today we live in india how our family is how family themselves are very different they are not the same everywhere uh and how within the families we construct differences and discrimination starting from gender then we go into caste then we go into communalism we go into uh you know economic uh economic inequality we go into an analyzing media the meaning of loving your nation or nationalism which is a very big thing now since last few years in particular so we kind of take an approach of getting children to see what the issue is at hand see how it touches your and my life and people that we don't consider leaders and big people are the ones who are bothered with this and have done something in their own lives to confront these issues because if you tell the story of gandhi and ambedkar and phule it's natural that i'll feel like oh this is something great leaders can do what can i do but if you tell a story of hero kumar bag or women from uh, you know mines in kodukottai for example you know that people who are not known or not considered leaders have made a difference and so that is the point of inspiration then we go into the next kit which is understanding change because change is continuous this is something that we are seeing from kit 1 onwards itself and uh, uh so uh we look at change as a phenomena to evaluate how it is you know the different aspects of it and decide our own criteria to qualify whether certain change can be indeed called progress or not this is something contextual and this has to be also based on certain larger values of fairness of justice not just for humans but for everyone and so it is essentially uh, taking a look at the story of our country from 1950 uh, to uh, to say 2000 or so in when you know the policy of globalization was accepted as a formal policy so to look at how the country changed and what it decided to do and where it's come to and whether that is fair and whether it's fair for everyone and so again it is done through activities and stories and i mean just to kind of give example you not only talk about the destruction that's wrought by things like big dams for example or industrial farming for example but also look at positive stories or resistance say in plachi mada against the corporation coca cola or the bilgaon story in narmada valley where dams were built and energy was generated without harming anybody so i'm just kind of giving you glimpse of it so in fact it is kind of a evaluation of the idea of progress in a very fundamental way where you are by looking at it based on uh, uh, criteria the criteria that you can understand to be uh, fair for everyone as well as a long last everlasting and then lastly we come to a kind of you know looking at myself where i am today and uh, my future the way i will i will confront uh, a, a kind of a you know culmination of all the ideas uh, in an applied manner uh, in the last kit 
So this is what Sangati comprises of. Uh, these are, there is a manual given to, sorry, I, how do I go back? These things that you see here, these are teacher's manuals. Uh, and teacher's manuals, as I said, are in three different languages. There are workbooks for each child uh, in their own language alongside these teacher's manuals. And teacher's manuals have all the session plans and also the worksheets and things. And the session plans are in great detail, but obviously the idea is not that the teacher does everything that is written there. The teacher adapts it, contextualizes it, because the teacher knows best. So I personally, I like cooking, so I call it a recipe book kind of a approach. That I follow a recipe, but I finally adapt it for my taste and for those who I'm cooking for, and depending on what I get in my surroundings. So, uh, so and then we have lots of very big size teaching aids, because we work with large, hopefully large classes, People think large classes are not good, but being working in municipal schools where numbers are dwindling, we think that 30 children in the classroom is not a bad thing. So these are different teaching aids, as you can see, they're flip charts and posters. And so these are not just teaching aids, a lot of group work that is done and children go out and do activities, go home, do surveys, analyze the data, ask home about people's experiences in the family, uh, and uh, uh, get stories from there, get ideas from there. I mean, I mean we don't have the time to get into the detail, but uh, uh, you know, a whole lot of classroom processes depend on that. So this is the Manthan course, which is spread over two years. And Manthan is the first year we mainly get into looking at the child, the teacher, uh, the process of learning in terms of the theoretical understanding about learning and then the education system at large. Uh, again, done, uh, done through the perspective of revisiting ideas rather than take it as, uh, you know, what is there in the larger system. Year two is the mainly about society, education, and teacher. And so the same kind of things that you saw in kit four and kit five about our society and uh, understanding change, are essentially brought here and also a critical reflective uh, teacher as a democratically active person rather than a person who's passing out, passing down textbook knowledge to uh, given textbook knowledge to children. The so teacher as a co-constructor of knowledge and a person responsible for her own political ideas as well. By political, I don't necessarily mean party political ideas. Yeah, so these are the some of the visuals. And we use visual aids also at teacher education yeah. level because we feel that our need for understanding through different kinds of stimulus is not related only to children. It's there in adults as well. So if you the teachers themselves don't understand the principles of learning in a cooperative way by using diverse pedagogical uh, methods, knowing the reasons why that is done by having gone through it as a student, then you can't expect the teacher to do that when the teacher becomes the teacher there in the classroom. And so the teacher needs to have that exposure, experience, that emotional feeling as well. It's not just the, uh, not just the uh, experience there on the cognitive level. I mean, anyway, cognition and emotion are, are inseparable in that sense. Okay, great, so Ratna joined. Yeah, and this is our module on Saat Saat, which is on gender, which is, I'm not going into details. I'm just now going to concentrate on the last two slides and which is about our learnings. What we feel is that wherever we work, we have so many people working here. And so we all start work because we feel something about the situation that we, see around us. And that's the reason why we start our own initiatives in our own way. We also started our work like that. And so we just felt that as we started growing up with our work, felt that while we work in whichever situation we work in, we need to have a larger perspective about what knowledge is, what the place of knowledge is in society, and what is the 
what is our intervention in education going to ultimately what kind of society is it going to create so that analysis of why things are the way they are and where our work is placed in that is continuously necessary and that is something that gives us focus it shows us the challenges at the same time it gives us a conviction to go on despite the difficulties it's very easy to talk about this it's difficult to do and it's not only my experience all of us are party to that this is a continuous praxis based process we keep on evaluating revisiting our own ideas in terms of our experiences from the field we also feel very very closely and this is something because we worked in the uh, government school system we learned this as a precious thing is that quality and equality are inseparable people who choose to send their children to non government schools do it because they are not deliberately doing it they have to make that choice because the system is made to be unequal and there is a multi grade education system because society wishes it to be an equal society so it is through education that one must expand that vision as it is a right for everybody to have the same kind of uh, facilities for uh, learning it's not only in terms of content and provision of space but also all the kind of the what was visualized essentially in the common school system of the kothari commission and just as the uh, just as the children from poor families would lose by not having good education they would also the children from privileged families also lose by not uh, uh, learning with uh, the people from poor families the experience that we just heard of madhu madhu bhuna because otherwise the, their education will be anemic and so all aspects of education from ecc to higher education and each and every aspect of education in terms of content pedagogy assessment um, uh, you know the the thing the intervention of bureaucracy everything is interlinked and one needs to understand that um, diversity is is important because we work with the large number of schools the diversity in the there are teachers who work with us we also felt that because one just quietly goes goes ahead and does work it has to do that and so in a large system the longer you work with them the better it is to have that sense of confidence that they put in you as well the other thing is there have been always pressures to adapt because of various you know various kind of particularly because of issues of finances but we have we have stuck to the small work that we do in the schools and while we have adapted in our own ways uh, we we have kind of stayed on our own path and somewhere the system also sees that we feel that they have uh, begun to kind of acknowledge respect and value that we also have learned by working with teachers and teacher educators and others in the field that majority of people want the world to be a better place it is not just people sitting in small rooms for people like us they just don't know how to they are just inundated with too many issues at every day and so uh, working with them and showing them small ways of making change makes a difference these are some of the things that uh we have been able to do on the way uh, one is that have a sustained relationship with the principal corporation uh, we have been able to have our inputs in the national education uh, national education policy in 2005 and our work has been integrated both in the syllabus and uh, textbooks uh, we have also been able to intervene at the maharashtra state level to construct the syllabus of evs in particular besides other social sciences uh, yeah so i won't go into the partnerships some of the challenges that are there are uh, of course the kind of work and this is something that is for all of us it's like what you envision what may be there in your manual for teachers that vision and that kind of a transformation may not actually happen transform may not happen there's transfer lots 
when we start working with the teachers in schools there was resistance but as i said when we came to the issues that we feel are in fact supposedly controversial we felt the teachers changing because they also were concerned about wanting to address these issues and didn't know how and when that uh, avenue they found they felt uh, somewhat somewhat you know differently about our work uh, the other thing that i wanted to uh, that all of us is that there is no culture of criticality everything is is seen in quick fixes the most important thing that is there in our society indian society largely and everywhere else particularly for us is that we feel that what is empiricist positivist you know coming from the uh, basically the enlightenment uh, ideas is that is that that is knowledge that is something that one needs to kind of reform in fact and knowledge needs to have its basis primarily in ethics justice enrichment of learning fulfillment of learning rather than simply being able to prove this is a point and i made this experiment in a you know in a successful way or this is the data i collected and i'm showing this uh, to you and i'm accurate about this yes all those things are necessary but they cannot stand on their own without these primary aspects uh, so and this is a very big challenge that all of us are facing in society today so making people see this that autonomy uh is a big challenge uh and uh, so this obviously comes to the issue of you know lacking common vision about the core purpose of education why is it that we have schools is it so that people get jobs but today people are told that no if they don't get jobs they should uh do something else like prank pakoras which is perfectly all right but if everybody is going to do that then who is going to eat those that's also good. so yeah and who fries the pakora that is a critical question right and so at the systemic level particularly since like last 10 15 years there is rapid change and the place where is our place of work which is in the school schools are bearing the brunt um and uh, there are so many multi grade schools and so many challenges that teachers are facing i think this is since it is all going to be given to you i want to uh, spend time these are some of the some of the things written by teachers and children these are some of the photos so i want i will stop now and ratna has also joined if you need to know more about our work some of it is there over here because dot com dot dot otherwise we are here i'll uh, pass around the thanks a lot thank you very much Ratna has also thankfully joined. Ratna, if possible, better talk a little bit briefly. Ratna, huh? Introduce herself. Ratna, are you there? I don't know if she's there. I can't see her now. Ratna, you there? No, maybe she's again dropped. She's finally. She's somewhere outside shooting, so she's finally difficult to connect. There are some questions in chat box, but I can't see them. I can see them. I can ask you. Can I? Okay, Rajaram, will you be reading the questions uh, to Simran Ji? Ji, Vinay Ji, yes. I can I can make a question if you like. So one of the questions was uh, from Padmanabha. What were the main challenges faced during the integration into the government curriculum? Yeah, one of the basic challenge that was there when we started working with the when we when first five years when we worked in one municipal school where we developed Shanta Ji's work. and gave it concrete shape it was our facilitator ratna who used to teach and so we tried to learn from the children as to what whatever we were doing whether that was working or not by forming forming the prototype and after those results were studied by people from the tata institute of social sciences from other government 
bodies. The question that was asked was, you are getting all these kind of changes in the children because your person is teaching. And what happens when the real classroom teacher takes over? And we felt that this was a very valid thing. So we started working with about 25 principal schools at that point. And we faced great resistance. And that was one of the reasons was that people felt that what we were doing had nothing to do really with the subjects that were being taught. And, uh, you know, things like we had a very different way of looking at things like living and non-living, for example, just to give, give an example. But the teacher's idea of those concepts was so different. And uh, they felt that... Uh, Uh, textbooks and so on and so forth. And, but they felt also that they were being experimented on. So if our work is good, then why are we experimenting on a number of schools only? Then we should go and work with, you know, better schools, you know, the so-called better schools and stuff. And so uh, we felt these were very, very valid questions. But as I said, things started changing a bit only when we came to the content in third year and so forth, so on. When we were starting to look at society the way it is, and then looking critically at the issues to do with, you know, the structure of society, hierarchies, and things like gender, caste, and things. We were very scared at that point, in fact, because these are the issues which are not ever taught in schools, looked at in schools in a forthright manner. And so that is the surprise that we came up with, is that teachers felt, yes, now this is something that I want to do. This is something that bothers me as well. And there's something about it in the textbooks, but it's not sufficient. And this is, this is as a person concerns me as well as the kind of class that I'm teaching. So there things started changing. It's not like even today, for that matter, teachers would rather have somebody else do the class, our people do the class. And in the pandemic, that is a very big challenge, in fact, because two years, the teachers were not there. Our people were going in the communities. They were supporting the teachers through whatever the online mode was happening. So now in the new academic year, we are going to come back with that challenge of getting the teachers back. Uh, so that, that is there. But at least because we've been working with them for such a long time, and because there is a change in the syllabus itself, what we are doing and what is happening in their textbooks is fairly correlated today. The perspective as well as the content, not necessarily in the chronological way. They know us also. The other thing that I forgot to talk about and write is that while working with teachers, all of us have kept it very, very clear in our mind that they are, they are people who are like, you know, Professor Krishna Kumar calls the little dictator made by the system that way. You need to rekindle humanity in them, give back the respect they deserve. And once you start doing that genuinely, they also see you as people who are actually cared to be there. So that's... So I had uh, one question. So, so uh, the many of the topics that you talked about seem fairly controversial. Yeah. That is regarding globalization, caste system, religion, nationalism. War. Uh, war. Yeah. So, uh, like getting it adapted by the government school curriculum in BMC seems like it would have been a major challenge. Oh, so, yes. and uh, sustaining it, that is, it didn't get taken out. Yeah. I'm, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. I completely forgot to do that. I say that is that, as I said, it's a supplementary course. So uh, the uh, regular school textbooks are taught on an everyday basis. What we get is an hour, uh, uh, hour twice, uh, twice, we get slots every, uh, two, two slots every uh, week, one class of social science and one class of science. So teachers combine those two classes in the timetable and they do Sangati uh, thing. So it's not like uh, they keep their stuff aside and teach this. At the same time, because we have worked closely with the government, even in the Maharashtra uh, syllabus formation level, a lot of the work that we have done uh, is reflected now in the way uh, the textbooks are made also. Earlier it wasn't like that. Earlier it was very, very challenging to do that. 
So, uh, yeah. And so, as to just kind of expand on what the problem that you're raising is that there are teachers who don't think like us. They don't think like about, uh, us about a whole lot of these issues, right? About caste or gender or communal issues or nationalism and war. But what they probably value is that they get space to debate and discuss. And so while the structure of the lesson is already there, uh, they do that session, right? So, but they put their own ideas in between. But it's the children also have their own ideas. <laughs> and so there is that process of, you know, discussing and debating and disagreeing that happens in the classroom. We have seen that in our own classroom also. So it's not like there is a consensus on everything all the time. But there are differences of opinion are voiced and they, that space is created and I think that is of value. So it didn't uh, get attention from the so, Maharashtra no. government and at uh, that so, level. No, in fact, it's, it has been integrated to a certain extent in our Maharashtra syllabus right now, currently. We don't know when the syllabus changes what is going to happen to us, but it will take a little while for that to happen. <laughs> So, follow up question to that would be. But I, I, I'm just sorry, is Ratna there or not? I don't know. Ratna, please uh, uh, fill in if you're there. Okay, sorry. So, the follow up question to that is you know, you have information in your books and you have opinions that you talk about. Now, because these are controversial subjects, you actually have both sides and give room for debate. Or are you just professing something? Okay, let me give an example. Okay, we uh, we like with an example of uh, caste. We start the session on caste with the game where we ask four participants to come and give them different kind of tasks, and they start at different time. So the complexity of tasks increases, and the time given decreases. While the first person who finishes, who started earlier with simple tasks, wins. Because the first one who finishes always wins, right? So <laughs> then the children talk about this, whether they experience certain things like this in, in society, whether they see it like this. Then what is it that you see in society that is like this? Because if children themselves say, even the winner says, no, no, this is some stupid game. It cannot be like this. But isn't society like this then? So then they talk about that. Then we we take Premchand's story, Thakur Ka Kua, and uh, tell the story, but we end it uh, before the story actually ended, you know? And so when, you know, the woman drops the pot in the well and doesn't actually get fetch water. In the story also, she doesn't get water, but she goes to a dirty corner and gives water to the husband. Here we stop it and the children then discuss whether she uh, was able to give water to him and how old the story you think this is. So then there are discussions. So there are, so obviously there is a certain input given with certain perspective. It's not completely left totally open, but there is, there is information that is given from all kinds of things. What we are clear about is that there is any perspective in the textbooks, which is the dominant perspective. Society is also full of dominant perspectives. So is the mass media and social media. So we also have a perspective, which is there only for one hour a week. If we were to work for more than that, we would see more concrete results. But even when we work in situations, we see immediate results, not only in the way children process their ideas, but mainly in terms of what they do. Girls differently. They start changing in terms of the domestic work. I mean, these are just our early marriages, particularly in villages where we have partners who work in villages. We see very, very immediate kind of a change in those situations. So uh, perhaps it's not the change of you know making somebody become uh, an IIT Kanpur graduate, but it is somebody who's. I mean, that's important, and both things can work together. But needs those people, but those people with certain ideologies that they will bring to life. So I have another question from on the uh, on the chat box. This is uh, Amrish Garg. Uh, he's from the Princeton chapter of Asha. 
His question is, how are you measuring the impact of your work on the students in terms of the outcomes that you desire? So this is, we, we maintain process documentation as well as we maintain case studies of children. And we also look at the way the children work in their workbooks. And so it is, as I said, it is uh, the, the decisions children take in their own lives in terms of their ideas about, say, you know, equality in terms of gender, uh, in terms of caste discrimination, in terms of their ideas of looking at, you know, uh, uh, equality, essentially. So we, main, we maintain case studies like this. Uh, this is something that we do internally as a process where children fill up worksheets uh, also at the end of the year. Teachers also fill up worksheets at the end of the year. And we grade, meaning we kind of analyze that data internally. Whenever we have the wherewithal resources, we invite experts from uh, other educational institutes to study our work, to study the impact of our work. And we, we understand our work through their lens, through the lens of so-called educationists. So this is the way we evaluate the work that is done in this course. I mean, one of the things which is not something that is the primary focus are, of our, our thing, all of us know that children in municipal schools find it difficult to read and write even when they reach class four. When we start working in class five, one of the first thing that teachers start telling us in one, first one or two months is the children's thirst to write and their ability to express themselves because it's the first time children are writing about themselves, about what they see around them, about, about their own ideas, about, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, putting knowledge that they learn in textbooks and what they understand of it in their lives. Uh, so, uh, so these are the changes. The attendance is one of the very big uh, thing that we study. The attendance on the day where Sangati is timetabled time and the attendance on non-Sangati days. That is also one of the criteria for our and students. And what is your experience with that? To much more, I mean, almost uh, like near 100% attendance on the day Sangati is done. Right. This has been consistent. So, not that we feel that it should peter down on other days. Oh, but, but there is and you know, when they, whenever there are teachers who resist, children actually go to the office room and bring a bag and give it to the teachers, teacher para. And many times teacher, children take initiative to stand in front of the class and reading stories and doing things. So, so uh, in, in, in I mean, each, uh, all these things are there on the website. So I so we'll keep it the last uh, two questions. So uh, then we'll move to the next. Rajaram, there is a question on this side. If you are okay. Ah, go ahead. Yeah. So Simantani ji, hey, you know, like one of the reason we are gathered here is that we have been you know, like a, ASA has been there for thirty years and trying to make impact in education space. But at the same time, we are looking at this conference to also revisit, you know, like what the next 30 years of ASA should be. So like leaving ASA aside, the question is more towards, you know, like if you really have the magic wand and you would, you know, build 2050 by that, what will education 30 years from now in India will look like? And just pick two, three things that stand out for you that you really, really want solved in next 30 years and in 2050, if any of us are alive, we are not going to be talking about that topic. Yeah, the first thing we have to do is to send all our children to the same school where we live. I think that is some a choice that people like us have had to choose schools. That choice is a very problematic thing for us also, not just for those who don't have the ability to pay money to go to so-called good schools because our children are also losing out. If we didn't have the kind of diverse experience of you know, working with people's movements, for example, or working with theater group, for example, some of our team members have done that, we, our lives wouldn't be enriched. So uh, having same schools, 
for all of us to study in and to uh, also uh, make education responsive to ultimately what is society supposed to look like rather than you know looking at as a channel for gaining employment um, that is one of the things the the you know that discourse has to kind of start and become a uh, main discourse in terms of looking at society as a whole in terms of re uh, evaluating our ideas of justice progress and life with happiness so um, one also needs to place that as the core of education so that comes to the content of what we do and that essentially is the purpose of why we should work in education so uh, and and we feel that whether we like it or not it is the state has to take responsibility because the state has the resources and the state has the staying power how much ever uh, people like us start uh, schools they can be there till a lifetime more or less at the most what after that so we need to kind of place our work also in that larger thing and compel the state to change that doesn't mean that each and every school becomes a replica of the other there needs to be contextualization and it is possible i mean we know many teachers who work in government schools that have made that change because where they are placed they make their school a good school where they are placed and that kind of a leeway is there in the syllabus if one is you know able to demand that not with the change the government at the center things are very very difficult but because you asked me a question to imagine i am imagining that they are not there uh, last question uh, can i give a short do you currently have any plans to mainstream this curriculum to other schools at right We work with all the Mumbai schools, which is about thousand dollar schools, and we also meet to all the schools in Mumbai government schools, Mumbai municipal corporation schools. Um, outside Maharashtra, we haven't worked with schools. We work with organizations that work with schools, or they have their NFE centers. Uh, but uh, we have plans, but we it's not like others are coming and. Asking us to do that, it's very difficult to do that. If any government is happy to uh, have us there, we will obviously be able to uh, see how that can be done. I guess see we this. didn't know, but we'll probably ask you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sanantani ji. It was a wonderful presentation. Daji, okay, thank you. So, so thank you very much for yeah, giving yeah. us this. Like I learned a lot. So I didn't know too much about Avali and the Sangati uh, curriculum. So I learned a lot, and I'll certainly learn some more. Uh, thank you, thank little. you very much for giving us this time. So I invite Purnima and Arun to uh, come to the stage along with me. So this time I also have to make the signs. <laughs> I should sit there. You should have the water. I'll give the. Please sit in between. I'll sit here. So, 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 I'll sit here. Okay, so uh, let me first introduce Arun and Purnima here. 
Uh, so they are both uh, running the school, a school called Marudam, uh, which is in Tiruvannamalai. Uh, they have been teachers for a number of years. So Arun used to teach at the KFI school in uh, Chennai. Purnima used to teach at Olcott School. And Purnima has a long connection with Asha as well. Her mother, Lakshmi Surya Narayanan, used to be a trustee of Asha India and has been with Asha for a number of years. And uh, so the topic of our discussion today is reviving education after COVID. And uh, the part of the reason, see, uh, like their experience is not just in this area of reviving education uh, after COVID, it's much wider than that. But in the context of reviving education after COVID, all the three of us were part of an education support group uh, which was looking into that topic and which was part of the reason why I invited them. So I will first uh, ask them to introduce themselves and about their schools. They have already talked about that a little bit with India, but please uh, uh, repeat that for the the broader audience. So basically, like um, we uh, together run a school called Maradam Farm School in Tirumanamalai. But uh, as Rajanaman all, all, already mentioned that our journeys were different. And my journey basically uh, for the 26 years have been with uh, underprivileged children um, in various sections, uh, whether rural, urban, slum, as well as street children, um, independent designing of uh, curriculums, but integrated with always with government schools and uh, state organizations. That's my uh, basic work. Also, <clears throat> which uh, I thought was a contribution for my own uh, uh, learnings and as well as with teachers and teacher training is to facilitate um, uh, learning where the children can take at multiple levels. So let's say a sixth standard child has not begun the formal uh, literacy for whatever reasons. Uh, the levels cannot be just sixth standard textbooks. So my work has been primarily how to facilitate uh, learning at various ages and level, uh, ages and standards, where the children can take it in their own pace and whatever, like, you know, their own um, levels. So then they are integrated into the system rather than dropouts. Um, <clears throat> uh, personally, uh, uh, have learned a lot being in Maradam school, but our focus has been experiential learning. And so during times of COVID that Rajaram was mentioning that we're a group, we also uh, like uh, contributed to uh, looking at Tamil Nadu syllabus and how the teachers in the government uh, schools plus the private schools who are interested in this kind of facilitation where probably uh, system was really collapsing or collapsed. What was our learning from that? It was interesting. Yeah. Arun, so when you introduce yourself, we can also probably talk a little bit about your work with Forest Way and the other work related to environment. I only now, maybe after 25 years of teaching, I slowly beginning to accept the uh, objective teacher because I'm an accidental teacher. I'm not a real teacher. I stumbled into teaching and it's been a journey of uh, trying to become a teacher. Many years ago, I was a wannabe teacher. So slowly today, I would say, maybe a maybe little bit of a teacher. And like Purnima, I taught the overprivileged children. <laughs> she taught underprivileged children. <laughs> I went to a school with the children. <laughs> and I don't have any rich experiences and all that from that kind of stuff. Uh, one of them is an interesting uh, departure. So there are children from different backgrounds there. I struggle with underprivileged children. I struggle with children with learning difficulties. I struggle with children who are first-generation learners. I'm not a teacher who's able to handle all these things very well. And I also struggle in a class of mixed, you know, these are, so I'm a fake Maradam teacher. <laughs> so, you're one of the founders and I'm, 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 I'm completely fake. <laughs> uh, the only thing uh, like, like I'm doing right now, I like to pull that up from under my feet and other people's feet all the time. 
uh, uh, I will. I was the last bencher in this in my class as a student, and I think I'm a last bencher as a teacher. <laughs> you can such a position possible, like, you know, uh, basically question all the givens kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I only can define myself of what I am not. I am not an engineer. That's the only thing I can say. And I That's the clear, clearest uh, self-identification. <laughs> Everything else is wannabe. I'm a wannabe conservationist. I'm a wannabe turtleist. I'm a wannabe a forester. All that. Because there are people, real people, doing work on the on the field. Like when there's real teaching, there are people uh, like the is doing. There are people doing real planting on the hill. Uh, I I am the front. You know? <laughs> I can talk in the mic and all that. So they put me forward and say, "Oh, this is the guy who's doing it." This is a whole team working behind. You know? So I mean, all of our work is teamwork. So. And well, it's only 13 years old. Let's see what unfolds. And somebody asked you 30 years from now, what should education be? I'm like, hmm, 30 years from now. I can't think two, three years from now, what it should be. Like, no, leave it on 30 years from now. Should there be schools? I would say, no, let's abolish schools. Like, you know, that, and find a different way, but I don't know. You know, I can't even imagine 30 years from now, humans will still be around. Like, you know, I, I really doubt it. Like, you know, climate change, what is happening. So it's interesting. Anyway, so only thing this forum, what was exciting for me, Rajaram called, is that um, we managed to survive through the COVID times. And I'm feeling pretty proud about that. <laughs> you know, basically, this whole thing of not listening to anybody has helped. You know, didn't listen to parents, didn't listen to teachers. Now don't listen to the government. Don't listen to you know whatever. Do your own thing, and uh, that's where we are. And that's that's probably where we can go today. Yeah. <coughs> So yeah, so my next question, like I just want to uh, understand your views on what has happened during COVID. That is not the revival of education. So uh, in India, the schools were closed for uh, close to 600 days. It's about the most of any country. I think uh, only a few countries like Uganda closed the schools for longer than India. So uh, even in that, Tamil Nadu was probably one of the longer even among the states. And uh, the, so the, it was very well known right from the beginning that all this talk about online education was nonsense for 99% of India's population. Yet, people persisted with that uh, story and acted as if there was something being done about education. Everyone knew there was nothing being done about education. So there was no effort to take the education to the children in whatever form. But the, what is even more disconcerting to me is there was almost no protest from the parents for reopening the schools. The parents were also uh, pretty much at peace with education not being there. So the a clue to that to me was that like the only half-hearted attempts at revival of education was only about revival of board exams. Like people were very concerned about how to conduct the board exams and how to award the degrees and whatever, and they weren't concerned about education at all. So even though there was no class, they wanted to see how to conduct the exam uh, or how to award the marks, not even maybe conduct the exam. So uh, what is wrong with it? Like as a community, as a society, as a nation, what is wrong with this? Who wants to start? <laughs> no, but uh, I, being in a rural background, I think there's a huge difference between what happened to students in a rural setup and what happened to students in an urban setup. Now, I myself lived in a rural setup, live in a rural setup, so I don't have too much first hand knowledge of how COVID played out in cities, except by talking to people who are in cities. It's very, very different from what happened to us. But we didn't notice there was a COVID actually, honestly. <laughs> in our village, for 60% of the time that COVID was seemingly raging in the world, they didn't know these things. When they first it was China. And then they said maybe in Chennai or Mumbai or somewhere, but definitely the Thirunamle uh, town maybe had a different experience, but Thirunamle rural area we had a very different experience. So some, a lot of it was very interesting experience. The children had a whale of a time. Finally, they could play all day, like you know, those, those children who could uh, were left off. But of course, they also pressed into work. You know, I mean, but even that is not too bad. They were working with the family, you know, they were working in the fields. They were, so I wouldn't say it was a, 
a tremendously horrible thing that was happening. I definitely saw lots more play. Was it good for them just to play all the time? That's a debatable thing. I think better than going to school. But I mean, did they lose out now? Maybe yes. But urban India being sitting in or even in a thrown on like 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 place in the ground. They are locked up inside the house and had to look at this online. I mean, I think it's absolute madness. You no, know? it didn't work for anybody, and I don't know how you pretend it to believe that it's working. That was a you not know, very big thing. The other one was very. I mean, other aspects also. Um, the farmers, for instance, suddenly had no transport to send their goods to the market. Right? They became localized. They were put on a cycle or a moped or whatever. And go around selling their produce. Like, you know, suddenly the economy became much more, uh, what should we say, more meaningful. You know, and uh, people were finding solutions. I mean, there were problems. The world was throwing at them, but a lot of innovative answers were emerging from from where people were. And uh, for us, uh, more than community, we have a bunch of people. Some who believe COVID itself is a conspiracy. Some who believe you know, we had a whole. We had a COVID committee, some of whom believe that COVID didn't exist, right? And to vaccine skeptics, to vaccine non believers, to everything, the whole range, gamut of uh, possible uh, perspectives were there. So it was interesting for us. So we grabbed the opportunity to say, like, what should we do being where we are? Because it's so, it's so unreal in many ways. But we are the people who are planting trees and the people, and all these hundred odd people who are employed by us, we're not going to stop them from working, you know. So how do we keep functioning? So we, uh, whenever there was a huge wave of paranoia, we would stop for a short time. But, and um, then we'd continue. But in terms of education, it was interesting that, you know, again, among parents, we had a range of uh, uh, you know, perspectives. Some who did not know at all, and uh, some who were very paranoid, those who had houses inside the throne and right down, and some who said, you should, you should not go to school. You know? But interestingly, after a few months, the people who are insisting on online or whatever began to see the same thing that urban people saw, which is that children are getting addicted to the screen and they're using, you know, using the screen for anything other than education. And they're all, even at other times, they're playing games. And there was a new screen addiction on the rise. And they said, no, no, COVID is better than screen. <laughs> you know? So let's go, go back to school. And even those who are most scared, Said, no, 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 I think we'll take this to COVID. We'll come back to school. We had some teachers, children, or you know, children. So and the fact that we could keep going and, uh, you know, that we kept functioning in the middle of all this, we were also pretty scared. We are near the district collector's office. You know, we are near the district headquarters. Somebody could report us, or somebody, or something could happen. But everybody knew, and everybody either turned the other way or <laughs> whatever. But uh, and then slowly through the whole forum, we, we got to know that it's not just us, there are all kinds of interesting things, including Asha, who did the uh, you know. Thank you. So, like, uh, <clears throat> learning never stopped for children. I think we discussed that in the forum. Each of the, as, he, as Arun mentioned, for urban or like people who were in the cities, it was very different from the rural. Uh, I don't know how it was uh, for very, very remote places. It could have been very, very different, um, I think, because I was not in a very remote place. But definitely, I would say that uh, one saw that uh, children actually enjoyed it as a break. Most of the children. Uh, initially enjoyed it as a break. Uh, they thought, okay, uh, like many people glorified family life. Um, and uh, I completely agree with Arun in the sense that there was a lot of learning uh, according to the eco economy as well as, you know, being with the family and uh, supporting their in the village rural uh, spaces. But what I would think were concerns which I noticed was that why we also kept it open, that we had a social responsibility, you know, uh, of keeping a space where there was socializing, especially for girl education. I thought like after a year, there was a very big problem, like where uh, teenage girls, 
uh, how they have been in uh, rural as well as I've heard so much of domestic violence within uh, cities also. So for women and girls, opportunities of travel, opportunities of meeting other people, apart from family people, were completely cut off. And I think after a year, I think people suffered a lot in that area. And uh, child marriages in Tiruvannamalai, I know that because I was in touch with the district uh, protection officers, have had increased by like at least 15% reported instances. Um, so quickly, quickly, people, because of dowry, got people married. I'm sure all over India, there were many situations. So the whole challenge was that keeping this, uh, like when we kept Marudam open, like I also knew that Asha was open and many other alternate spaces kept spaces open either in the villages or in their own spaces or kuti kuti houses that they had. Brought these aspects as uh, spaces where people could visit. We also ran a small learning center in, in the next to the village apart from Marudam. So it was interesting where the people wanted to come and have a space of common spaces. You know, and that was a very important learning, I think. And uh, when we had this coalition uh, during COVID time, I think to keep learning spaces alive, very, very important, not to shut them down uh, during crisis like this. Uh, our own experience was that reporting, very important because the schools are spaces where children and vulnerable people report instances of injustice. So it was very important this duty to keep even for teachers as uh, uh, to ally for adults to have spaces where they can report things that they were not comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to say was that uh, collaborating and learning from each other's experiences arose. A lot of uh, interactions with the outdoor spaces because we had to innovate many, many outdoor spaces. A lot of learning happened from that also. Yeah. I don't want to share. It was interesting how organically they all of you. Initially, oh, the shutdown mode, I think everyone was really happy. Because our friend told us it's 18 days also. Good thing. We'll win Mahabharata. Like Mahabharata was in 18 days. 18 day break, everyone was ready for it. But after that, <laughs> the, when it went on, um, Initially, everyone was uh, then slowly, I think adults and children began to feel the need for put you know, without children, she gets she goes mad. You know? She has to have children, children to be teaching the, the, the strongest identity. You know? That's true for Paripurna also. So Paripurna suddenly began to uh, turn to farming because she hadn't uh, you know, the second identity. If you can't be a teacher, at least be a farmer. And so she began to work in the field. So it's very interesting, organically began to So all the community children, we have quite a few of our children, began to go work in the field. And said, Nothing can be wrong about working in the field. How is that uh, uh, COVID risk? So the neighborhood children began to join in, in coming and working in the field. And so slowly this outdoor spaces, outdoor learning began to emerge. And we said, how can we have multiple outdoor learning spaces? Okay, we shouldn't be in a classroom. But why can't we be outdoors? You know, uh, let them make us to not have that. So it slowly began then. So it's only with the neighborhood children. Then it should be children from a little wider area. And then we began to work from several locations because we had the path that we run, the hill itself is there, then the school is there, then we had this uh, center we have maybe leased uh, thing. And also we could also use, uh, you know, we can also use uh, you know, other resources. So several locations. Uh, Outdoor space. This is how it began, I'm saying. Like, you know, being outdoors and also saying, like, can we use this opportunity to design education differently? You know, not the book learning, not thing. Like, you know, can we use our uh, strength, this, uh, in observation, but learning, experiential learning, and increase this uh, thing? And so we went on to do that. And so interesting things have emerged. Now teachers are asking, can we not go? Can we not go to the back? Can we can keep questioning this itself. So the uh, so uh, see in uh, some spaces as you said like uh, what Maridam offered or Asha Chennai also we had experience of the mini school so education continued and uh, 
some of the more deleterious effects of this COVID closure was avoided. But at the broader thing, there are several things that have been reported about, like, first of all, it's not just education that is affected, as you pointed out, uh, like uh, the children's welfare and safety and security was, and uh, like uh, several psychological issues which uh, would have developed because like kind of the space where they interact with the peers was taken away from them and an ability to report any injustice was removed. And then there are also very practical things like which we saw in the, some of the poorer hamlets that we worked with, nutrition levels had dropped. So hunger had gone up. So uh, there was, uh, and child labor had increased and marriages have increased. So all this on top of it, whatever basic learning that they would have received from the school had stopped for two years. Despite other learnings that certainly would have happened, especially in a rural, agricultural context. So the school learning had stopped. So uh, uh, what has your experience been with, not in the context of Maradam, but in the broader context of how education and all these other things have been affected by this COVID load? As you pointed out, uh, Rajana, it's very true that like a child who is in third standard now already is in sixth. What is the burden of learning? It's a big problem. And in the Tamil Nadu network, which we have, um, so I would say that was a big challenge, you know, like uh, how this kind of, which you mentioned about basic learning, uh, which already, not all the schools have anyway done it earlier. It's not like a third standard child. Top of that, if you have to like face that you're like happily going into sixth standard and the, suddenly you've got like so much of load of syllabus and things like that, it was very difficult uh, for children. Uh, I think that uh, everybody's pretending right now. I would say when I evaluate, like uh, every school is pretending that everything is normal. You know, that is very human psyche. No, every time we pretend everything is normal. So the responsibility from... Uh, uh, to make it more uh, approachable for children, uh, to have voices of children as well as teachers, I would say. Uh, it's not like teachers have, have the freedom to express. Uh, state, not just state run schools, even private, there's a lot of hierarchy. So it's not very easy. Uh, so I would say the word was agency, which Arun brought in, in our school meetings, not only for us, for everybody. How do we as teachers educators and the roles of parent or whatever. You have different roles, right? How are we really looking at basic education and using our own agency to demand or express it? And how can we have then people supporting and resources that we have? So maybe a teacher would have decided, look, I'm going to teach like five children of my class, not online. And where are their resources? You know, the child, a teacher really feels the need. And where are the supporting systems? And I think that supporting system is uh, needs to be there continuously now. It is not just ended with the COVID. You know? And uh, as Arun was mentioning, trying out different ways of motivating, uh, not just only bridging gaps, but re-looking at the way we've, uh, uh, we've approached our syllabus has helped many teachers, I would say, and students. That has been my experience. The positive experience has been that where the children were like, oh my God, I don't want to go back to school from wanting to go back to school because they wanted their friends and socializing, plus need to be helped. Not like most of the schools now are just doing like Kanga Chana, ABC, one, two, three, uh, repeatedly because they don't know what to do at sixth standard and fifth standard because two students have forgotten the basic like education but that shows that you've not taught them properly earlier why would you forget people have not forgotten how to harvest in the village because they went to school did they forget why would they forget what you've taught that's something for you to look at no? like so that is an indication i'm saying i saw that as an indication okay. so uh uh, what, what do you think are some of the steps that should be taken right now to kind of uh, 
assist these children who have now missed first two years of schooling. Giving them a period of catching up, or how to bridge the fact that they have not been in school for two years. Honestly, I don't have any answers. I see first acknowledging the fact that they have been school for two years is critical. Now, if you don't acknowledge it and just say, I thought they just come back from a break, and it looks like a long weekend or a long, or a long summer vacation, that's not okay. You know, many studies show that you know that even the summer vacation can be quite detrimental to learn. This break, the so-called break in learning for children who need the continuity, and lots of children need that continuity. But for me, uh, like basically our type of schools, I don't see the summer break as a necessary thing at all. In fact, I find it harmful. You know, so our, our schools we mostly don't close at all. We I mean, accept children who want to take it, who want to make it. we just say keep continuing to come. But so, but uh, so two year gap definitely there are, there are there have been many impacts, and not all of it is I would say academic. I mean I would say a lot of it is uh, socio emotional, you know. And how are we going to address that? I feel so. One thing is clear that we can't just go back to regular school. Should not be doing that is is uh, given. But what what are the things that will involve? I think it involves a much deeper brainstorming, discussion, thinking about. Uh, in fact, that's what we were trying to do in that forum. But uh, my big question was, who's going to implement this? Like, you know, I mean, we as educators, but I do see the second point is that we as educators, I think, have been too silent. I mean, we, they have not uh, raised our voice enough. We have not, I, mean, I don't know what forms we should have taken, but we, we kept quiet as a government. You know, and, and it, I think it, we failed our students in that sense. You know? um, and that's something I see now. And now, again, now that schools are on, are coming back on, that we should again raise our voice and say that just let's not go back to, let's use this opportunity to engage differently. You know? yeah, I think it involves a whole bunch of complex ideas and possibilities and exciting also. But it, it would be great if it can happen. But how is it going to happen? I don't know. I think uh, one uh, way forward probably is to really consolidate and uh, have our voice uh, collaboratively, whether it's different organizations or uh, like teachers who are very serious, who are sincere and who have committed uh, wherever they are, like in government schools or state schools or you know private schools and uh, also organizations which are working with education to have a collaborative understanding of what we are really doing, you know, and uh, then to form, I really think like Manaru was saying, these forums are very less. <laughs> we need to really create those forums. Um, and that, that forum, I'm sure, like, as you said, uh, there are people who are also ready to listen to that. It's not like people are not willing to listen uh, to your suggestions. But at the implementation, because the priorities keep changing, like now you go to the government schools, most of them are writing exams, right? Now, everyone is into, so you can't even go and like approach teachers regarding what you want to do meaningfully, like did they children understand what they're writing? Oh. Uh, you know, and then like uh, copying, every place to copy, they have to cope with the situation. So it's more like survival not so much as a reflection, right? So I would say then that is the only way we can reflect this. Even now, I think in April and May, we should keep the forums alive to make sure that in June, how they're going to come. And so uh, that seems very critical, like how. And uh, I also feel that like, although these supports, you no, know, like basic education, for many people have supported, like let's say a child is in eighth grade and they've not like, uh, they've missed a lot of basic education, they're not able to cope, then I think actively we have to do level-based learning. Not just you can't do two, three years together on in one year, no? But for, you have to break those lessons or uh, like concretely break everything down for the child that it is more child-friendly. 
there is more anchoring into understanding which they can do it on their own and there is opportunity to do lessons which has come oh we are all back and all the everybody is going to school yes wonderful but more hard work so one of the things that uh, like i, I, I think uh, if education had been carried out in a good way it would have been one thing but it, uh, even before corona it wasn't as if things were happening in a proper way so one of the things like uh, if you uh, if the teacher clearly understands the skill level of the children and teaches according to that which is one of the basic ideas behind any uh, good pedagogy uh, that would uh, like the fact that they are two years behind children make a, uh, uh, the job of a teacher that different. So they are now teaching to a uh, different set of skill levels than they would usually be used to. But then they can continue teaching, teaching by understanding the skill level of the children and teaching accordingly. Right? Uh, that was never happening. <laughs> Do you think there is any chance of something like that happening? Yeah, one only thing I want to add here is. Before, I mean, I really want Arun to respond to this because a lot of experience we had. But I really think one other thing is it's a big change because uh, when you had this whole discussion in Asha conference, I just uh, about the vision and mission. I really think uh, one part is that thinking that, like, uh, you know, many people from private schools they couldn't afford the fees and they have gone back to government schools. During this COVID, there has been a shift and people have quickly, quickly put many. So then, then, then the government teachers are back there where you have more strength. But again, the same question. You have lots more children now. The strength has increased. But I don't know if there is a preparation for that. Uh, to handle, now again, like uh, the Aham Avehi person was saying, there is more diversity than before. But mm, accidentally. <laughs> was not planned. So where is that opportunity being highlighted? You don't have the same set of children. They are not the children you taught. They are a completely different set of children. So where is that that is possible, I'm saying, that you need to plan for that and there is need to be more challenge in that area of uh, skill-based learning that a teacher has to do uh, and they need a lot of uh, support in that, I'm saying. The teacher is faced with a new group of students that they were not having. There is a hand raised. Yes. Many, uh, yeah, uh, just wait for a quick response from Arun. Sure. No, she just said, you know, the message is getting done. No, I think that you're repeatedly pointing out, Arun, the school. Uh, the exam uh, as an end result has to be abolished in possible. You know, this, this, that exam is the uh, evaluative, the only evaluative tool is uh, it's, it's definitely not true. But uh, there were these things, and I don't know what happened to them. I, I've lost touch because this continuous comprehensive evaluation as an idea, you know. No, I know, but I'm saying I I'm, if you look at it in principle. You know, ah, that, 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 yeah, no, so um, it became caught up in you know, filling up a whole lot of forms and going through a whole bunch of, and therefore became more burdensome. But as a teacher, I definitely feel uh, that, you know, the teacher is not in touch. So people keep coming and asking, so how an alternative school do you evaluate? Evaluation is a non stop job of any teacher. You know? At least in a class size of the kinds that we have, 15, 20, and all that, it's very easy to do. And if a, a person is not paying attention, it's not or not, or not with you, it's very easy to make out. So, but what happens in larger classrooms that you teach to a mythical middle, right? So they, they keep, so they just assume that whatever you're not, teaching is reaching these people and keep going at it. And then the exam as a, as a way of evaluating whether it's reached or not. A yeah, very, very faulty system that 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 hundred percent needs to go. That's one uh, how it will go. I don't know. The other one that I want to say is uh, I was talking to a private school teacher during the COVID times, and uh, teacher was saying that uh, this whole online thing is terrible, and you know we shouldn't be doing it. I personally don't see it as being violent and all that. Then I said, uh, why why are you doing it? 
Donc, si vous avez un moment de Miguel, quel est le fils? So, so this was the three or four children of the school you know, who are signing in for seven hours of classes every day. Otherwise, they can't charge fees. They, 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 my salary won't come. So, what do I do? She said, okay, no. So, it's a trap of the school as a business uh, thing, functioning thing, like, you know. So, that is the second thing I would say. God, I forgot. Uh, uh, go ahead, Meli. Uh, th uh, thank you, Rajaram. I, I, just briefly, I just wanted to say that I, I, of course, completely agree with Purnima and Arun about any good school, the teachers should be able to see where the children are lagging behind and and kind of tailor what they're teaching to what the child needs to know, right? I mean, I think, I think all good ASHA projects hopefully will be able to do that and we are seeing some examples of that. So I think that seems to be the easier problem. I used to think that's a big problem, but I feel that's the easier problem with financial projects. But, but as Purnima was at this pointing out earlier, I think what had been, I guess, uh, hopeful, because we had seen some changes because schools are freed, children are freed from the creative things come out, come up. I feel all of that is being reversed so quickly because of the tyranny of board exams. And I see this in ASHA projects supporting government school teachers. We're really back to, we got to pass the board exam, we got to finish the syllabus. We're not able to stand up to that. Um, so Purnima was suggesting that we should have more forums and more dialogues. I, I, I wonder whether there's an opportunity to have more detail around how we can, how ASHA can be guided to do this within, uh, uh, within the government school systems. I, I really think that uh, uh, the support of teachers, like I have, uh, have uh, some understanding, I wouldn't say complete understanding how ASHA teachers work within schools, uh, but I know that like for anybody supporting the government teachers, I think government teachers need a break. I don't know, they've come back from a break uh, for a very long time, but they need a break to uh, like, you know, understand what's happening for which I think that uh, th this kind of a collaborative effort can only happen if, uh, you know, like for whatever they do, they know that there is support. I don't know how that is going to be possible, but then they have to be convinced that like, you know, uh, because already in Tamil Nadu, I know that like one very sad part is the Balwadis are closed. So I really think that's criminal for livelihood. In COVID times, livelihood is a big issue. And if you have a whole government balwadi closed, how are the women going to be working? So I think these areas of community support could come from the ASHA teachers, which they anyway were doing in the mini schools earlier. To continue that effort, The, we have this Illam Teri Kalvi for one hour, like community based. That's okay, that's a good event, whatever. It was an in between thing. But why are the Balbadis closed? Where are the supportive system for a government teacher in terms of like um, uh, other areas where they're also coping with the exams all the time? So, where are those spaces? I think we should enter, like uh, whether Asha or even Marudam, we support the neighborhood schools also. We've taken some roles like that also. So, yeah, that would be interesting. See? Okay. So, uh, my next question was going to talk a little bit about that Dilam So, uh, I, I am only personally aware of some of the things that is happening in Tamil Nadu. If others, or if you know about what is happening in some other states, that would be useful to add as well. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about the state measures to deal with the situation? So I know that, for example, in Tamil Nadu, for the first one uh, or one and a half months, uh, they weren't asked to just go back to the textbook and blackboard, uh, chalk and chalk and board kind of a technique. Instead, they were asked to make the children comfortable with the school by conducting a lot of activities. So that was done for about a month or two. But as as you are saying. It's now returned back with vengeance to board exam and uh, like the back to the old method. And the only additional component being the Ilam Tedikalvi, which is happening in the evenings. So, uh, 
what do you think about the state response to the situation? I, I think that like any other government program, it should not become a government program. That's all. That I'm saying like, if you just, uh, like, you know, you just launch a program as a response to some situation and then everybody's trained. And then is that program reevaluated? Is the need for that program, continuing program, has to be looked at carefully, you know? So if otherwise it just becomes like one norm, or oh, in the we go ahead, it work. Is it working now? Is it need? Is that need there still? What is the level of need? What should we do in the Ilam Kalvi now? Who has to be reevaluated? I'm saying. At that time, it was more like uh, Ilam Kalvi was for people who are scared to send children to school, that there should be community based uh, learning where many children were not going to school still in between the second wave and the third wave. And then there was a proposition and then a lot of stories and things were introduced, which was amazing, like how they, they were trained. But if you just do it for one hour, what are the children to do with the rest of their day? And so now that schools have opened, Ilam Teddy Kalvi has become just a, you know, what a symbol. What it was intended was different, I'm saying. So how do you keep that alive is the question like for the government schools and for uh, people who are working. I think as a concept, it's good, but how do you keep it? That's what I mean. I think I want to use the opportunity of acknowledging what Kerala government did, right? With the midday meals and stuff. They were sending dry rations home to each child. Also, you know that, right? I mean, the, to, to think that ahead, like you say, this schooling is not just about Education, they also you know nutrition and things like that, and ensuring that it reaches every home and they did it pretty efficiently. So, and that was fascinating you know, for me. That was one. Uh, the other one is this, uh, that uh, that you know, like I said earlier, where where is the forum for raising these questions? Where is the educators forum? Where 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 is the voice for educators? Where do we come into the public glare and speak out and and be heard? You know. This I feel is lacking, and I feel we need to create. You know, there are associations, there are, you know, there are actually associations, but they fight more, I think, for uh, to function as business entities, you know, within the, within the rules. And so they are just fighting in terms of uh, like typically any other association. But I don't see uh, with the children's welfare in mind, uh, you know, a forum being created for re raising these things. Like, you know, I don't know if it happened, I don't have a television, never had one. I don't know, there were TV debates on the state of education in the country. Like, you know, if this was a prime time topic or any time topic at all, whether it came up and the educators called and whether these questions raised and, and such a thing, I don't know. Uh, then randomly, I also was recollecting that, uh, that Finland did a great job of, uh, you know, making people, children aware of uh, social media and uh, ills. And there was a similar uh, program in Kerala. Uh, that they did awareness of the thing. So interestingly, every now and then some sort of thing seems to emerge from somewhere. And I, I, one thing I did find is the Tamil Nadu, at least asking some questions, uh, they had, they did have, there was some uh, questions raised about what to do, you know. I, mean, I, I think we quickly, all that little away, we came back to no, uh, so-called normal. But, uh, but how to strengthen these spaces in between, you know, where, where there is a debate, where there are questioning, where all these things happen. And that's where I feel we have to play in that space. Yeah. See, like one more thing is that uh, the what I was trying to say about I'm sure that other like states, because we are in Tamil Nadu, we did uh, present uh, a few uh, samples of what we do in Madhudam through this coalition. It was presented to the uh, joint director, SCRT, and in Tamil Nadu. And they have in, 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 in incorporated some parts in the Inlam Thadi Kalvi booklet that we had all uh, proposed that what worked for us. But that was then. You need to rework again on what should be there in the booklet. That's what I mean. Now that relevance is gone. 
So then you have to, again, they have to find out what they have to put in the second booklet of the Devi Kalvi, which is going to go on. It cannot be the same as what I'm saying. It becomes redundant. No? Maybe you have anything to add? So, uh, uh, coming back to Marudram and uh, your own response to Corona. Uh, so, your own response to Corona. So, see, uh, at Marudham, your education has all been about, as you had said, doing things with hand, uh, kind of respecting the ecology, understanding the impact of human beings on ecology, and uh, a practical learning as opposed to a textbook one. So, I'm sure a lot, uh, like you will probably feel a, a, like a little validated after this experience with Corona and how edu education of the other sort has not felt well at all under this onslaught. But anyway, have you had any opportunity to think about uh, your choices in terms of education uh, due to this COVID? Uh, have you had an opportunity to think about that? Uh, I think in the last, last meeting, in the last meeting, one of my colleagues did. We were in a, we were in a walking along the street, right, and learning was happening, right. And then I, I asked him, "Why are we running the street? Why can't we just keep doing this sort of thing?" And he said, "Sir, you know, please, just say it." <laughs> kind of thing. And you know, and uh, so, like you say, it is a huge validation of, uh, you know, uh, learning, you know, in different, in different ways, in different, creating different learning uh, methods or whatever, like, you know, opportunities with the, with the ecosystem around, with the opportunities around. And I think wherever one is, there are immense uh, possibilities. So, even in the forum, they brought up saying, but government school teachers, uh, don't know how to do it. They are not having done it. You go, just go say, go create a learning opportunity. How, how are they going to create learning opportunity? Never having experienced it themselves, like you know. So in the forum, they kept asking, why don't you come up with uh, uh, you know more models, worksheets, whatever, whatever, and all that. So I did do a few and keep sending, and now I'm also writing in the Tamil Hindu. Uh, I'm hoping that will be a series of articles on um, you know observation-based learning, which other people can uh, can uh, adopt, you know. Uh, but yeah, definitely, uh, see, for, right at the start, so we have something called a circle deck, right? we weekly once we meet and talk. And uh, so uh, when we connected, maybe a little after March, when we connected first on, our, on online circle time, the person that asked is like, you know, okay, this has happened to the world now, but something called COVID has landed on the world, and the governments have chosen to respond in this world. What are we to do? What are you to do? What should we as an institution do? What should I as a teacher do? But what should you as a student do? 13 year olds, okay? And it was fascinating to, uh, this question, right? First, stop them. But later, when they thought about it, they were quite clearly able to say what constituted their learning, how they would like to go about it. So I said, if you're completely free to design your time you know, and design your learning, how would you learn? What would you learn? How would you go about it? And that's where the whole agency matter took took root and started flowering. And all children have, um, you know, I would say the last few years has been very rich in learning one hand skill, in learning you know, a new, a new, uh, you know, some have gone and learned, trying to learn a new language or a new something that a new instrument or a whatever. It is all designed by themselves, like you know, and uh, and everything was possible. Like, even for us adults, you know, that why don't you use this opportunity? Now you don't have any hours of school. Or what did you do differently? What did you learn differently? You know, so in that way, I feel uh, we have got extremely validated and strengthened. And hey, this is the way. Like, you know, I, we really feel we have something to share with the world. And I'm thirsting to like and share and you know, find different forums of being able to share these things. It is so empowering. I feel pretty empowering. Also, when you, when you the whole world is feeling brought down to its knees, and if you are Feeling like you know, I'm free. It's a great feeling. I'm feeling sorry for the world. <laughs> you know, but they also feel happy to be free. You know. Okay. Personally, for us, uh, that we 
uh, as you said, Raja Ram, the validation came from so many people contacted us as resource people. Uh, in the sense, they wanted to do something, you know, like they wanted to help. And uh, so we kept on providing help in many ways, like workshops, because we kept the doors open. We didn't close during COVID. Other organization came and stayed. There were people, teachers coming and staying with us and uh, doing workshops because uh, it was interesting. Like, uh, like uh, Karunalaya, a very long friend who were working with street children in uh, Chennai, they came, so we made a lot of educational games for them, like uh, where they can take to the street children and they gave a feedback that they loved it because the children started playing together. They're not going to school, but they have their community. So they're like revising the word games, they were revising the numerical games, everything through games, 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 they were playing. And that was a nice thing. Then also thinking creatively, okay, now this child is not going to go out. They don't have a school. What do we do for them to make sure that still they're socializing, still they're active as adults, it's some outdoor. And I found amazing government teachers I met in Tamil Nadu. Uh, who were doing bird watching, uh, shrub uh, collections, they were doing herbal medicines for children uh, and, uh, and many of them sh shared that many children had formed these groups of organically growing uh, vegetables in the house and uh, lots of kuti 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 like these kind of endeavors were there where they were collaborating, the government teachers, along with children and doing many, many meaningful things during that time. And so that, even to bring that to a forum, it's not like people were just like without their agency redundant and uh, just sitting in their houses, it was something very important. And I, I would like for validation is that I would like to keep those collaborations alive even after the schools have started. <laughs> so uh, those are all the questions that I had. So if you have any other points to add, you can add, otherwise we can move on to Q&A. Uh, there are questions. Uh, so, Padmana, you want to ask your question? I can't. I can't. can you speak up? So, the question was about uh, girl children. There is a, a dropout of more girl children than boy, girl, boy, boy children, I guess. And the yep. question was should we be focused on girl children for the next one to three years? Uh, one stage we realized that the neighborhood, right, uh, the children didn't have school. Uh, the, their common school children or private school children they didn't have school. So we asked them, would you like to uh, have school? And the, many of the parents and the things we tried creating a learning center with our parents, with some teachers, we tried creating the thing. And what emerged there was a whole bunch of things can't share at all, but some interesting things were um, the girls asked for the school to be run because otherwise they were being employed at home, they were being forced to work at home. The boys were allowed to play, the girls were not allowed to play. So they said, please run the school, we'll get a chance to get away from home. Like, you know? So that was one, one interesting thing. Um, also, but in terms of what they wanted from the learning center, it's also very interesting. They didn't want to come, many of them didn't want to come back and just go back to the books. They wanted to learn games and just the crafts and stuff like that. And, and when we offered books, they were not interested, except the much older children who also began to look at this as an opportunity to, uh, to, to um, do correct learning, improve their skills and stuff like that. You know, so many, many, many interesting things emerged. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, girls suffered more, okay, but the other, but it also triggers another response to me that, uh, which we have been talking about again and again in some of our forums, which is like, you know, this whole thing on girls suffering, improve girl education, we really need to be educating our boys, because they are the ones tormenting the girls, like, you know, we need better boys, we need better men. <laughs> so we need to really focus on men and girls, we like, you know, they stop being the kind of people that you are. And I think for girls' education, first you have to begin what the girls want. 
Now, please, when we, I would request everybody who's working with women and girls, when they're back into work, when they're back into the system, now that the COVID, whatever, everybody's back, please make a survey, data collection, what do they want? Don't provide solutions without finding out. I really think that's a very big mistake. You'll be creating more mess than <laughs> like putting things because it, they would really like, I think women and girls will share what they require. There's no doubt about that. And if you're providing girls education and women education, ask them support. I think within six months, you would actually, the, anyway, the women are the people who've anyway done all the work in the COVID. It's not like the men have done. They have done, I'm not saying badly, but I'm just saying that women are capable of holding that space, right? So they don't need any kind of sympathy, provide support, give what is necessary, ask the children in government schools. I would say, please do a nice uh, survey of questions where they can write confidentially, give the voices to the child, then decide what they want. And this is for the this is for the teenagers, right? Mostly the vulnerable group is the teenagers, or exactly. Good question. So uh, I don't know who that is. Can you tell me a name? Yeah. So Padmanabha, like uh, very important is that uh, in sex education, uh, if let's say uh, the children are forced to child marriage, or like let's say somebody they went uh, or they ran away with a boy. It could happen like that, no? But then don't criticize when they come back to schools. Like, you know, you brand them or give labels. Girls do suffer a lot from that. And I know that many, many schools ask children, look, you look very different. How can they not look? You're seeing them after two years. But it's such a loaded statement for a girl. Because it means that you're sexually grown. What does that mean? You would never ask that to a man or a boy. So it's very important, like, that's what I meant, Padmanabha, like, find out what they want, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions from, oh, there are more questions, oh, go ahead. No. So uh, one of them was, um, they, they wanted to know the, the people who create software, they have a vested interest in, in pushing content through software and all that stuff. <laughs> They just want comments on comments on why why that is or, or uh, what uh, so, so so what what do you do about it? This is what it's, so this is the question. I, I'm not asking. I guess uh, people like Digest and all that like this hybrid learning pushing hybrid learning has been very aggressively done over this. COVID break and uh, yeah, much against uh, real world evidence and whatever. So there has been a concerted push and government has also joined the bandwagon very often and kind of promoting hybrid learning and things like that. So I think this idea of uh, individual, sorry, I, I guess this idea of uh, individual students learning through technology, either through communication or directly from a computer, like personalized assistive learning, has gained a lot of traction over the last one year. I think yeah, you should just uh, treat that whole thing with a huge pinch of salt, like bucket load of salt. You know? uh, I don't know what else to say. I, I would also like, sorry, like uh, both together, Padmanabha, it's like for the children who are younger, no, the girls, uh, their role models are people, mothers and sisters in the house, apart from Arun said, like, if they have nice men around, lucky, you know, like, but for younger children, it's very important that their, their community spaces are kept safe. So, if you ask the older girls, the teenage girls, they take such a responsibility towards younger people. So, they will never say anything selfishly. You know, that has been a role of a woman or a girl, but then also they will be always indicative of what the girls, younger girls need. So in asking the older children, both are covered, right? That's what I want to say. And regarding uh, the technology, it can also be a team a technology. I'm, I'm saying that earlier in the online, it was very individualized, right? Now, if you want to use computer education, at least get 
like 10 or 15 children around one space to keep those modules alive. Where you can have classroom teaching, but more concretely where it is more group teaching rather than individual teaching. There is a scope. And uh, lastly, I want to say that uh, in the, according to me, we have to publish in forums that porn has increased. And according to me, I have really uh, done a lot of study in this, at least to our own children in Marudam, plus the neighborhood children, where I've been seeing children uh, access to porn has increased. Maybe there earlier, maybe now we are seeing it more. I don't know. But it is at the age of seven and eight. So you can't just neglect that whole area for girls' education. And I think because you have to address, and already I've started talking to children about porn as young as eight and nine. Yeah. I have one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when, uh, so there, first of all, there's a comment that says that you should ask the girls what they want. So, uh, my comment is actually exactly the opposite. Lots of times they don't know what they want. So, I disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like, let's say you are asking me and I don't know what I want, and I will say I don't know what I want. What will you do after that? If you're an educator. But many girls don't say that. No, no. If I say I don't know. Yeah, then I, you will have a conversation with me. No, no, me. No. I'm saying, like no. Arup was saying, observe. Everything need not be verbal. So you have to observe whether the child is low, like if they're like feeling very thin. And then you can also give them ideas about, okay, this is what, like she was saying, I have a have a uh, lady was, I'm sorry, I forgot her name. Simantani. She was sharing that, uh, you know, the local stories are important. Like what another, like local child has benefited, another girl has benefited by something. You know, have your own resources of positive stories, but not hyped up stories. I'm not saying I can, not that way. Real practical stories of how they dealt with their situations might help to open up. But I, I, I agree with you that like there are like, I have nice books. Uh, which Tulin, uh, we, me, and uh, we were involved in making books where you you can have the children open up indirectly. You don't have to speak, but they will write it. Then you don't even have to write the name. Indirectly, you can provide support. So what I meant was when when I say that they don't know, sometimes I don't know what they want. It's because. It might be better for me. So they, they might, within their own constraints of what they've already done, they might say this is what I want. But then, you know, there are so many things that they don't want. Yeah, more scope you Yeah. But they exactly. know what they don't want. At least ask them. Exactly. There, are, there are two questions from Prima Gandhi. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you can. First of all, how can an organization like Asha help you reviving education post COVID? What are some focus approaches Asha can adopt to help with this specific goal? Second question, what are some challenges that weren't before but became more apparent during COVID? For example, if the schools don't have ability to have online classes, the kids' learning was affected. What others? Uh, 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 so, uh, I don't know because I think many of you have already had discussions here and a lot of you are working with that. But I would say, ideally, I would say, uh, like you have designed, many of you have designed sensitively, you know, like uh, modules and please increase oral. I really think if you can do more oral work with children rather than so much of written work. Uh, because you don't you don't have a way to judge whether they've comprehended like the evaluation I'm saying uh, and uh, it's very and that oral work need not be only testing uh, you know the capacities to like say did they understand the sentence or something it should be related to like do they I mean some some concept is not understood or whatever but it's more important that they do more oral work. Uh, and so then at least the relationship with the teachers are rebuilt 
In oral work, you do rebuild relationships, right? And if there can be evaluation in oral, we used to have no earlier oral test. <laughs> I think oral tests are very, very valuable. Viva. <laughs> so most of the time, even now, when you submit a paper, they do Viva, right? I mean, so I think that's important. If you can keep the oral alive. Why would they not know what I was thinking? We it connects to two words. One is empowerment, and the other is entitled. So, uh, uh, am I empowered to think for myself and, and express that? That's a, that's a big one. And, uh, and this whole sense of, uh, you know, I, mean, I think there's a huge thing, you know, that, that uh, urban, rural children have this huge sense of entitlement. And I think, uh, vocally, you know, explicit versus uh, the others who are not. And one would think, I mean, so we had a, we had a, I had an experience which really set me thinking, uh, or not one, I think that, that experience of me thinking, we were in Chhattisgarh in the tribal area, okay? And uh, they're like, the food is being served for all the children, they're all waiting for everyone to be served and this stuff and all that. And then the teacher there was saying, I was just amazed at how much order there was, okay? And the teacher was saying that if there's no salt, they would never say anything. Until he put his mouth and said, there's no salt. Why did he say? Okay. Like, you know, whatever. And then, is that lack of entitlement? You know, or what is it? Like, is it acceptance? That, you know, they're grateful for the food that we get. One day there's salt, okay, there's no salt, it's okay. Like, you know, I mean, uh, well, I, I got quite uh, interest, interested in this, like, you know, because our children, uh, are quite complaining about many, many a thing, like, you know, and we, and it does, uh, you know, it does get the whole body. But on the other hand, to also have some austerity, to have some forbearance, and to have, be able to accept that always everything doesn't need to be perfect, like, you know. So, I mean, all this is uh, kept me pretty rolling, but, but I feel uh, oftentimes uh, we don't give space for the girl, children to express themselves. I like, you know, don't so, in a household, how much voice do they have? You know, mm -hmm. the, the whole unheard voice is like, you know, so I think that is something that needs to engage. Yeah. I do have one quick suggestion, like for our, because they ask particularly, apart from oral, I would say similarly because you were talking about teacher empowerment and teacher training and support for teachers in the state. Uh, like, ask teachers what they want. They, you can also ask the government teachers. In this area, they do see these gaps. What do they want to do for the children? And if that is, can be asked and documented, I would uh, be interested in listening to that. Also. Like, not only just in government schools, in all schools, teachers and supporting staff, if one can find out what are the gaps that they want and where do they want that support? Where do they feel uh, uh, that they are, are feeling inadequate to handle the situation? So, yeah, I'm not that hopeful about that. So we recently had such an experience. Baskar was saying, so we went around asking the schools what they wanted. The list was as usual. Yeah, yeah teachers. So usually, like uh, they want uh, like uh, repainting of one building, so there's a repair of they want that fixed, so they want a compound wall to the building, so they want the level of the ground to be raised, so that next time there is rain, there is the problem. So uh, they, they don't look at uh, things that directly directly influence pedagogy or the teaching of the children. They usually look for things which make their life comfortable. So we always struggle with that. So we rarely ask the school teachers what they want. We end up uh, doing the stuff anyway, partly because of that reason. So I, I have a lot of empathy for Raja Ramani saying this. Uh, I feel, you like, you know, what is this? And someone has come with an interest and I can see the brightness in your face. Uh, what I'm thinking is that probably you can ask specific questions. Uh, like you said, I usually ask the questions of what is it that we can give you that you think for sure will improve the education of the children? <laughs> it's kind of like uh, a bit like uh, I mean I, I I'm sorry like uh, but you can ask specific questions. How do you want us to help you with uh, this gap in learning? Ask specific. <laughs> What do you mean, education? You know, it's quite a broad question. I'm not attacking you. I'm just saying it's quite difficult to like answer that. 
So, uh, I think we have crossed the time a uh, little bit. So, so, we can stop the video, but we can continue the conversation. No, but uh, yeah, the video is supposed to go until 8 30. Um, yeah, tired yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the next topic. There's not oh, any of the. Uh, uh, they are asking about the next topic. They should be the no, no, no. I think they're asking about the next topic. Okay. okay. I misunderstood. <laughs> I couldn't hear everyone on the list. Okay. okay, so Raja Ram, maybe uh, we should take a couple minutes. As I expected, the conversation was very enjoyable. So thanks a lot. <laughs> so Luckily, it was enjoyable. <laughs> what if it was not? <laughs> I'm always a wonderful conversation. So, so, okay, so we'll move on. Uh, so, people in the US, so we'll move on to the next topic about mission, mission. Uh, so, there was a bit of a long discussion in Asha India forum, which didn't arrive at any conclusion. So, does anyone want to turn to some? Yeah, yeah. Asha, Asha, you are the best person to summarize the discussions at Asha India. Uh, hey, Rajaram, do you want to take two minutes break? Like uh, we have been you know, like going through this session for a couple hours. Sure. So let's I give two minutes break sense. to everyone and then we regroup. Uh, take, uh, and take a two minute break anyway. Okay, so let's do two minute break. Yes. I think for the people who don't understand English, please, I don't know what to do. I hope like uh, after the movie we're going to translate it. I so, felt very sad like honestly. Uh, all this while I suffered. No, it's time for that.
Hey, Rajaram, can you hear us? Namata, can you hear us? mission and goals. Uh, I have been part of these debates since ever and they are never conclusive and today's debate was neither exception to that. So <clears throat> what came out of that discussion is primarily we are discussing the mission statement uh, which says that we are the people who catalyze the socio-economic change uh, <clears throat> uh, through primary education. So, so the basic debate was what that change is. 